What's up, guys? I'm here with Mike Tim, who was the who is the director of our most recent Cranks Picks, Mr. Roberts. Thanks for being here with me, Mike. Well, thanks for having me. Thank you uh, most of all for for picking Mr. Roberts for Cranks Picks. So it was a, a surprise and an honor. It's uh, it's cool, you know. Yeah. It's well, the irony is that it came to me as a different genre short than it was i was telling you i originally was sent to me from someone who said maybe this will fit your more family oriented uh youtube channel and i i sent him an email back and i was like you haven't watched this have you and he goes i didn't get a chance to i was like this is definitely not a family friendly film yeah, yeah it doesn't have puppets in it in uh there's no yeah. train it's not mr rogers no and i think he was probably going off the name thinking it was about yeah. Your, yeah. your, you know, your standard good neighbor next door. Right. Well, I mean, that's really the theme of it is uh, not surprise, but just mis misidentity, you know, or mis misidentifying, you know, who you might think you know, and um, and even that comes with material. You know, you you don't know what it is, and you're like, oh no, this is definitely not family friendly, you know. So I think that's just sort of that it's just a part of like the the nature of the piece itself. And that's the theme is that you never know who you're really talking to. And that's uh, as we said, that's you know, sometimes the the real horror story in life. Yeah, I think instinctually we're probably our, our first um, response is to trust people and take them at face value, but you know, after seeing Mr. Roberts, there was definitely, I mean, there have been people in my life, especially living in Los Angeles, where you don't know all your neighbors. There's too many, but I did have one pretty rough neighbor who would do right. some pretty crazy things. And I was like, something's going on in that house. Right. That's the thing. Yeah. And I've had like, yeah, I've, I've had, uh, I have a story like that, you know, a, a guy that I, uh, I, you know, when I was in my Sundance festival days when I when I worked for the Institute and I ran the press screening room and then I did the information booth and that was in the late mid to late 80s when I worked for the Sundance Institute in Salt Lake City mm -hmm. there's a guy that would volunteer come out every year and uh he was part of our group he was kind of a good guy he was fun and then years later I read about him in the paper and he had when I moved out to LA and uh you know he had women locked up in his basement and he got caught and it was just like, oh my God, really? Like we had such a good time. <laughs> oh, that's terrifying. It is. It's like, it's oh. terrifying. You know? So you never so is know. That, you know. Is that know. where the idea came from or? or no, no, no. Let's the talk idea. a little bit about how you made the film. It, it is a good story. Well, here's the deal. It's like, you know, living in a world, but you know, as an adult uh, is one thing. And then once you become a parent, and you have kids, whether it's one kid or, or many, the world changes for you and the concerns change and the things that you look out for are different, right? Because now you're you're protecting your your young ones and all that. And and really it just came down to, you know, my kids are in school, they're walking to school, they're in high school, middle school and, and grade school. And, um, you know, it just, when I was thinking I'm like okay I need to I want to I want to make another short and I want to direct something uh, another piece and then the style of it I want to do something that's a little bit you know uh, a little bit more serious and then I just sat one morning and I just asked myself I was like what's my biggest fear for my kids and you know it goes back to when I was a kid the first kid on the milk carton you know was the kid that it's a heartbreaking story, but you know, the, the, the kid that he wanted to walk to school, it was in New York city, wanted to walk to school, wanted to walk to school. The parents were like, no, 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 no. And they just said, finally, they're like, all right, he's what, eight, nine years old. All right, let him walk to school. That day he went missing. And, and it just, it was one of the things where, you know, that moment where you, you realize that you're, your family member or your friend who has been abducted, you know, that moment when they realize that that person that they trusted is not the person they thought. And that was my biggest fear for my kids. I was like, holy crap, like that's, that's scarier than any movie I think I've ever seen. That's just, 
you know, whatever that is. So, you know, I didn't want to, I didn't, and I just wanted to do that. I want to do the effect of it and just the idea of it. And the idea is the story itself, because after that, you could just create your own story after that moment where right. you realize that, okay, that, that this, this is not what it seems. And, um, and we don't have to know anything else really after that, you know, after that, you just fill in the blanks. You don't have to know the before or the after you don't need to see like what he does or anything like that. It doesn't matter. Is this his first time or not? I didn't want to answer any of those questions. Those are questions that my actor, Basil Hoffman, uh, he asked me and he would ask like, well, what about the tools? I'm like, I don't want to show any of that. This is something that the audience will, they'll, they'll fill it all in the blanks of whether it's his first time or not, maybe, maybe not, who knows? You know, I've got my own ideas, but let everybody else come up with their own answers. Mm -hmm. you know? But that's where the, that's where the idea came from. And, uh, you know. Yeah, you, did, you did a very good job of telling that Thank story you. in a short, because to me, I think maybe it was his first time. But right. Anyone can have their own decision. And then at the end, how it just I agree starts. with you. That's my yeah. And that's the fun thing is like, maybe this is his 30th person. Right. His fifth. I mean, you, you know, that's what makes it such a, a good little short film. Right. And how did you make the film? You had a bunch of friends you were helping. You know, it came about that I, you know, this is where you work with a lot of different people. And uh, my, my the cinematographer, uh, DP, John Connor, John T. Connor, who is a legend as an AC focus puller. He works with, you know, uh, Chivo and, uh, and uh, you know, Alejandro and all those guys on, I mean, you know, Birdman and The Revenant. And he's worked on so many films over the years. He was, you know, Tony Scott's camera operator before Tony passed away. And John has just done so much. So he was DP in a feature down the street at the high school. And he asked, he's like, listen, I, you know, I live on the whole other side of LA you know, late night, it's tough to drive. He's like, could my crew guys and I, the ACs, could we crash in your house? I'm like, sure, come on, let's do it. Um, and uh, and then there was, it was at that point, it was like, well, you know, I've got the guys here. And then John was like, what can we shoot? You know, like, he's always willing to, he's like, I want to shoot something. I'm like, all right, well, how about this? I'll just write something for my house. You have all the equipment from the shoot. We've got the guys, I'll get more guys. We'll put a little crew together. I've got, I know the locations. I used to be a location scout, location manager, so I know how to where to go and I know who to talk to and uh, and I just know in my area. So I just like wrote it. I designed it for what I knew. Even the restaurant, I was like, well, we can't shoot in the restaurant. So what I'm going to do is they've got those big windows. All I need to show is him eating in the restaurant. So we'll just kind of be a voyeur. So I just designed it that way from the you know beginning to end, and we shot it one weekend and. And it was great, and um, I couldn't have asked for for more. And then we just built from there. And then I just, you know, asked my uh, friend Darren Highness, who's a sound mixer and designer, and he did that. And uh, then Gabe Hayes, the composer I've worked with before, he did the, you know, the the composition for uh, the score for the Girl Guy Space Helmet. And uh, I just kind of brought the band together, and, and it worked, you know. And everybody, uh, it was great, you know. I had so many excellent people and, and, and finding the actors was fun too. So, you know, yeah, Basil exactly. Hoffman, you know. Did you find really. everyone through relationships or did you put out like a casting call? You know what? I found everybody through LinkedIn, you know? And this is the thing is that yeah. there are so many traditional ways to go about casting. But I'm, I'm, you know, I love LinkedIn because I do connect with a lot of people. I connect with you. I just, you know, it's like all this stuff. And, yes. um, you know, I just had so many actors that reached out to me over the years that I said, you know what, let me give them a shot. You know, they're reaching out through LinkedIn. Let's just see who, who I'm connected with and whatever else. I looked at all the older actors that I had in my, you know, my connections. And I just reached out to every single one of them. Basil Hoffman, I swear to God, I had no idea who he was. All I know is a connection. I was like, he's, he was like, well, let me read the script. He loved the script. And then, and then I realized who he was once he sent me all his links to his stuff. I'm like, oh my God, you've been in so many of my favorite movies. And I'm like, that's <laughs> you. I'm like, oh, I'm going to have to check like, out. Yeah. Work. You know, but, you know, Mary Dallas, who is awesome. I met her. She, through LinkedIn, and then we met up on the, uh, 
you know, we met up at the Universal lot for coffee. And what I loved about her was that uh, she's a comedian in Chicago, you know, or was a comedian in Chicago. I'm like, you know what? I love when comedians act in a serious manner because they always have, they always bring something a little bit lighter to it and a little bit more human in, instead of just the, the, the direct dramatic approach. And I felt that worked. And then Catherine Maya, I actually worked with her on a TV pilot uh, called It's a Beach Thing that I uh, directed. And uh, I remembered her and I wrote that part for her because I knew that she would just kill it. It was, uh, she was excellent. So, and then I'm just Great. building in with everybody else, you know? What was the timeline from when it was time to go until it was delivered? I think we always shot in August. I decided, I wrote the script in June. I sent it to Basil. I went to New York where I'm from, New York City, flew with my kids and my family. We went there for like three weeks through July. I got back. And I had three weeks before Basil, because at the end of August, Basil had to go to New Mexico. And then John was still, he was like, all right, I give you this date and this date. So I basically did pre-production and everything. Honestly, I think it was in two weeks when I got back. Two, in two weeks, I put it all together. And then we shot. And then editing-wise, uh, you know, uh, Fabrizio uh, Dos Santo, um, you know, edited with him and we edited that probably in two weeks and then gave it to Darren Highness and he did amazing sound design and mix. And then, uh, and then I met up with uh, Gabe Hayes and we did that, you know, and like, so probably, I think we were done by October, October, November, you know, and that's, you know, when, cause we all, we're all working full-time jobs and all that. So it took time, but it was a quick turnaround. Yeah, it seems like a pretty easy, I mean, filmmaking is never easy. There's always challenges, but with the good relationships and and friends that you can call on, things can be done. Right, things can be done. Yeah. That's the thing. And, you know, if you set it up, you know, when you're not spending money as an independent filmmaker, you've got to be, you know, ready to spend time. It's yeah. You're asking for favors, you know. Yeah. Um, this just kind of fell in where the lightning struck and everybody just had that window of time and everybody just jumped on it and did it and knocked it out. And it just kind of happened. You know, it's, it's, uh, it's yeah. great. doesn't happen that, often, but. Right. Well, that timeline, I guess that was last year. That right? was uh, about a year. That was no, no, that was in uh, 2018. Oh, okay. All of 2018 because it ran the festival circuit all of 2019 into 2020, even through the pandemic. It actually played festivals, not virtually. Actually, they were at drive-ins. Oh, awesome. Yeah. Did you get to go see a couple of them? I did not. I, the, the, I couldn't because they were all in like Austin, Texas and all yeah. these places up in Oregon. And, uh, and so I couldn't get to any of those. <laughs> yeah. Did you make any films last year? Do I, any, any more shorts? Yeah. I did. So then, uh, you, know, it's, you know, through the pandemic, you really think about like everything and you're like, okay, what can we do? And uh, by, by this past fall, I put together a small team of about five of us crew-wise. Um, Mark Ponnet is another DP who I, uh, I've worked with before. He and I gathered the forces together and we shot another short film in this past November. Mm -hmm. And uh, we did that over a weekend. And um, one actor, Everybody social distance, everybody got, I did the whole thing. Everyone got tested right day or two before. So yeah. it was all legit. Um, most of the crew were all, they're all professionals and they were already still, they're working on TV shows and they were getting tested all the time. Uh, we shot in my house again, cause why not, right? Um, and uh, yeah, it did that. This one's a little bit more challenging. So it's taking some time. Um, what, you know what, it's March 30th right now. Um, we edited and then we were done by the beginning, like the end of December, beginning of January um, with the cut. And then now we're just doing, we have a lot of visual effects to do. So now this is where it's like tough, you know, uh, getting free visual effects uh, work is really, is not the easiest thing to do. And I totally understand why it's time consuming and there's a lot of work, uh, but I found some excellent people that have got a, you know, there's a company 
in uh, India that is, uh, you know, where they're working with us. And then we're about to talk with another company down in Argentina and they're going to work with us. And then there's a guy here in uh, LA that's going to do a couple of shots. So we're kind of farming it out to a team of people, you know? Yeah. So, I always so. love working with VFX. It really kind of makes the world feel small because you work with so many other companies, especially right. in India and um, in South America. It was always fun. You're wrangling a lot of people and right. a lot of data is being sent all around. Right. But So is this film, can you say the name of it? The film, well, right now it's called The Eyes. The Eyes. The Eyes. And it's basically, it's a, it's a horror film, a sci-fi horror film about a guy who's, Kind of he, you know, um, karma catches up with him, and uh, and the eyes of karma are now upon him. He uh, he buries his his neighbor's dog, and then after that, the secret's out, but not to the neighbor or anybody else. But karma knows. Yeah, oh, it's a little great. creature feature. So I'm uh, I want to awesome. do something that was a little challenging, a little campy. You know. Um, you know, we know that, you know, when you're doing stuff on a budget or no budget, you got to understand what you're making and what you're not making. And you've got to be okay with that. You've got to make peace with uh, the things that you can't control in filmmaking and uh, whether it's independent or, or, I mean, it's all of really independent, but um, depending on the budget, right? So you just have to kind of know what you can and cannot do. Yeah, it's true. Do you have any concepts for features? Oh, totally. Yeah. Now I've got a bunch of scripts that have, uh, I've been writing features for years now. And um, I've got a couple of projects that are out there with various producers. Uh, some of them I wrote um, as rewrites for them. Uh, some people give me an outline of, of a story and I write a script. Um, I do have a, a, a desert survival film that my producer Lou Arkoff on that one. He's shopping that around, and that's uh, called The Forgotten Ones. And uh, that's right now, that's at William Morris Endeavor, it's at Gersh, it's at Authentic Talent. Um, yeah, so, and then he's going to investors, and he's he's a pro. He's been making movies for decades, and his his father was Samuel Arkoff, who produced like 400 movies through the 30s, 40s, 50s. And uh, so Lou, Lou knows what he's doing. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah, so I'm just excited, you know. Yeah, is there anything before we go here, any, uh, any insight that you would give young filmmakers who might be watching this about making a short film? The, the biggest thing is, uh, you know, there's a difference between wanting to be a director and directing, right? And that's, it, it's all in the doing. And you just, just go start directing. You know, anybody can be a director, but not anybody can just direct. And it's really a process. It's a lot. Um, you know, people reach out to me, they send me their short films. I'll give them advice and mentor a lot of people. Um, and I'll just tell them, okay, now work on this. Go in just your shots, go in a little closer, punch in, work on the pacing, things like that. But directing wise, just grab your, if you, you know, you've, if you've got a smartphone, grab your smartphone and start making little shorts on your, make short films with your smartphone. Just do it. There's no excuses, really. You know, but and you can also, you know, the when I did, I did a feature film in 2012 called The Girl or Guy Space Helmet, and I shot it for $10,000. And my main thing was that no matter what the budget, there are like four creative elements that I honestly, really, the budget should not affect creatively. And that's um, casting. I mean, you can't get a major star or anything like that, but you can get great actors. There are no name. You could camera angles. That's all creative. That has nothing to do. You could do great. It's all your camera angle choices. Of course, that you know, lenses and things like that come into play and all that. But um, editing style is a choice. It's a it's a creative choice. You know, so the editing style of your pacing and that's all storytelling. And then, uh, and script, you know, you design your script for what you have. So if you're making a short film or even a feature and you want to do it on a low budget, work backwards, you know, figure out what do you have, not what do you need, what do you have? And then design your short film or your feature for everything that you know you can get. 
everything's make, personal. Make it, <laughs> make it easy on yourself. You know, just do it because everything else is just gonna like, it's just gonna be mud that you're gonna have to like tromp through and, yeah. uh, and don't do that. It's hard enough, you know, so just do what you can. I agree with you. Grab a camera and just start shooting. All that's I did was shoot home videos and things when I was a kid. It's just, that's all you can do. Just that's start it. working. Start working. Go to college if you want, or just find a way to w wiggle your way into wherever you want to be. And that's kind of it. That's it. But, you know, do it. That's it. Right? You know, and then uh, make them. And uh, if they're good, show them. If they're not good, then don't show them. Yeah, keep them. <laughs> that's it. Yeah. Well, Mike. Thank you. I appreciate you, your insight. This has been really nice chatting with you. And I look forward to you sending me the eyes when Thank it's finished. You. Thank you. And I, uh, I will, uh, I definitely will. I can't wait to do that and share it with you. And uh, we'll see if that becomes a crank's pick. Hopefully. We'll see. I'm sure it will. Yeah. Now that you're in the family. There you go. Did you see the rough cut? Uh, no, but I will watch it. Okay. Well, don't wait. I'm going to, cause I'm going to send you, I'm making new, more cuts. So. I just okay. sent my hair uh, a few more. Once, you know, after a while, you, you sit with it. You're like, oh, my God. I got to chop Wait, you can tell me when to watch it. <laughs> just say it's time now, and I will. That's it. Okay. All right. Well, thanks a lot. Right. Yeah. No. Thanks, Mike. Have a good evening. Oh, and, you too. Uh, I'll talk to you soon. Enjoy. Okay. Peace.